It's my real pleasure this evening to welcome all of you here. As you know, our speaker tonight um, is Felicia Marcus. I'm actually not going to introduce her tonight. I'm going to let a colleague of mine introduce her because uh, um, uh, he has worked very closely with her and uh, the work on um, managing our freshwater ecosystems and thinking about the ecology of those systems and how they pertain to water policy. Uh, and I want to introduce you a little bit to my colleague, Wim Kimmerer. Um, he's a professor uh, and a scientist here, a research professor at the San Francisco State, and uh, he would describe himself as an oceanographer. But again, he's a little not as salty as he used to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's pretty salty. I mean, he, he spent five years as an officer as in the U.S. Navy uh, on a nuclear submarine, so that's pretty salty. I think that's pretty salty. Uh, but he's, um, he's a real scientist, died in the wool. He has a B.S. Uh, in chemistry from Purdue. Um, he did a research fellowship at the University of Melbourne in Australia. He has a PhD, sorry I did this out of order, from, in biological oceanography uh, from the University of Hawaii. Um, he has many accolades, but I think one of the ones that I just really want to point out um, in a, is he was a recent recipient of the Brown Nichols Science Award from the Delta Science Program in 2012. And for those of you who are not really aware of the massive um, amount of respect for his work that that represents, um, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, but that award is not easily won. Um, and we couldn't be prouder of his body of work, uh, and a lot of that work was related to the um, policy that uh, Felicia works on at the state water boards, and uh, she, he's worked a long time providing science input uh, into the policy world in the, in the Delta, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Wim Kimmerer, and he's going to introduce our speaker tonight, Felicia. Yay! <laughs> nice. Thank you, Karina. I, now you know why I wear Hawaiian shirts all the time. <laughs> um, so this is an article from the New York Times. California's water czar, part empathetic confessor and part friendly scold. Uh, this is from, I forget what year it was. It's a while back. but 14 or 15, four, I think. 2014 yeah, or 15. Yeah. Um, so Felicia Marcus has been chair of the California State Water Resources Control Board, which I would say is probably the, the most powerful board in the, in the state um, because it controls water, and water is, you know what, in California. So, um, so Felicia was first on the board and then became, being, became chair of it. And as chair, uh, well, I was struck, and I think a lot of people are struck by the uh, equanimity of her, uh, just her demeanor and, and her decisions and how she was able to um, talk to and listen to people from all, all different sides of the spectrum, um, from farm people and environmentalists. And, um, but but more, more particularly for me was how well she was able to, or is able to integrate uh, science into her work and listen to scientists and seek out the, the advice and, and help from scientists. And I think that's, that's really important. I really hope, hope that sort of attitude continues on the board. Before she was on the board, Felicia was, uh, was head of uh, Region 9 of the US EPA here in San Francisco. And that was at a time when the water stuff was really boiling up and, and EPA got involved to, to not everybody's uh, pleasure, I think. Hmm. Um, but Felicia was heavily involved in bringing the parties together in a, in a, uh, a series of uh, meetings and, and confabs that resulted in the so-called Bay Delta Accord mm -hmm. that left us with some, some good water standards and kind of a much more, um, if not convivial, at least agreeable, agreeing to disagree sort of environment. So um, I'm really happy that, uh, that Felicia agreed to come here. Uh, she did so when she was still on the board she uh, termed out uh, last month and is, is no longer on the board, uh, but still has a lot of thoughts and ideas about how things work there and knows an awful lot about California water. So please welcome Felicia Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Wim. I've got this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's an honor to be here, and it's a pretty daunting crowd, I have to say, to be speaking in front of, not just because of the 
sciencey part of it all, um, but also just because some of my mentors and people I've learned a lot from are, are in the room. And now, because it's bright on my face and dark over there, I can't see your <laughs> faces. So as a strong extrovert, I'm assigning, Dean, I'm assigning you to look and smile at me so I know one person is actually <laughs> listening. That's a clue, clue for um, hearings. It's always important to look at people and smile at them, um, even if you disagree sometimes, because it'll help them get to the point faster. Um, <laughs> but it's, people, everybody needs respect. But it, it's also, because this center is completely cool, I have to say, but also really impressive, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm drawn to, for some strange death wish, to make a confession to you as I sit here, which is, I am a lawyer, I've been a lawyer. I'm an older, I'm a, an old public works director. I've done a lot of different uh, things. But one of the things as a lawyer I'm most proud of that um, I hope the statute of limitations has passed on is um, have any of you, because you, you are estuarine, many of you estuarine scientists, have any of you wondered why Santa Monica Bay is in the National Estuary Program? Santa Monica Bay and Estuary? It's a legislative estuary, and I helped write that language. Because we wanted to be in that program, because it's such a good program. So I got a lot of grief from people in the program across the country when I would go to meetings, and I thought they were just jealous because our indicator species was a surfer, and theirs was not. <laughs> just saying, you gotta be creative in this work. So make it happen if it's not happening, and figure out how. So I'm gonna do something, some of you were here at lunch, um, I'm, uh, or right before lunch, I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of the same ground, but I'm going to go uh, quickly. And I have to say, those of you who know me, it's a bit of a, a hobby horse of mine to try and talk about the overall issue of California water. You would think it's 101, but people don't know it. And the whole um, dialogue that you see in the newspaper, even in the in uh, hearing rooms, is sort of torqued and twisted by folks just talking about one piece of it or another piece of it and not getting a sense of the whole. So at, at, in my, my heart's delight, it will help free you from some of those misimpressions, and at worst, I will arm you for dinner party conversation. When people tell you, if those bleeping idiots just did this one thing, there'd be no problem, you'll know that they have no idea what they're talking about, and that in fact, it's a much more complex picture. And, and that, for me, goes back to my childhood and my, I remember my father, I won't give you the year, I won't give you my age so you can guess the year, dealing with people who are running for president. And one of them seemed very clear and I could understand what he was saying and the other one um, seemed fuzzier. And so I kind of liked the clear one. So I asked my dad who he was gonna vote for and he was gonna vote not for the one I thought was clearest. And I said, why? And he said, because he has simple answers to complex questions and they're too simple, he's not telling the truth. So I took that in, and I think my whole life has been looking for the complexity in things and people who can hold that complexity and deal with reality. So I'm gonna arm you for those conversations because when folks can acknowledge that complexity and the complexity that's in a, inherited in a crowded world and the messiness of dealing with the real world with people with different interests, then we can kind of look for solutions that are actually gonna take as opposed to the endless political dialogue of the, what I call the is so is not, you're a jerk, no I'm not level of discourse or the mighty Python level of discourse or Saturday Night Live, you, have Rosanna, you pick whichever one you want um, and we don't have time for it, which is really my main point. Um, the water board does a lot of things. There's a reason why we were very visible in the drought. It's not just because I seem to be the administration extrovert and so the governor's office sent everybody to me for profiles and sound bites and the like. I'm kind of a self-entertaining unit and apparently I entertained enough of the media that they stuck around. But um, it's also because the water board was on point for so many different issues. We administered state water rights law. We uh, administered the Clean Water Act, you know, s sewage permits, industrial permits, wetlands permits and the like. Uh, the drinking water program was moved over it to us in 2014 to make one entity responsible source to tap to really deal with that issue, to help recycling work and to help disadvantaged communities. We give out a lot of uh, money, billions of dollars a year in grants and loans. And then during the drought, we got emergency powers to do mandatory conservation in urban California and a lot of other powers but those were the ones that captured the headlines because of course everyone could relate to it and you know long story short the governor set a, a goal of 20% voluntary we got like 10 we tried that a little longer got like 10 
we, we did the mandatory conservation so everybody could feel that everybody was going to have to do it and we assigned the amounts based on how much people used. So people who used hundreds of gallons a day had higher targets than people who didn't use very much. Um, the public rose to the occasion and got to 24, which was pretty darn incredible. And most lawns didn't die because they're tough to kill. So well, let's talk about California water. And I always love this attack of the wicked problem. People use, w and I also like Godzilla. You'll see more of Godzilla. If you're afraid of Godzilla, you may leave the room right now. I'll still be your friend, but I won't understand you. Um, but uh, Godzilla is just such a great uh, metaphor for so many things. Any event, but the, the wicked problem being those intractable, challenging problems that you can't deal with in a sound bite in California water and the Bay Delta in particular, but everything in California water is like that. I talked about the elephant um, this afternoon. You don't have to read this slide. There's so many words on this slide. This is the whole talk, almost the whole talk, on a wallet card um, to laminate for people to be able to have and have it in their pocket so they can remember it's not one thing. And the key issues here are that, it, you know, why is there an elephant? I'm, now you're all thinking, why is there an elephant? It's, uh, as I said uh, earlier today, in California water, it, the dialogue, and I'm someone who was in it and then ran screaming out of it after um, the Clinton administration. I went into land conservation where people know how to make a deal and they do a thing on the ground and you see it and it's done and you see kids playing on it and they're happy. It was really good for the soul for about seven years. And then I came back. And it was the same people having the same conversation, maybe a little louder and slower, past each other that had been doing it for decades, the decades I'd been working on it. And it made me think about the, the parable of the blind man and the elephant where they're all describing a creature, but you can't believe this could be one creature. And that is very common in California water where people say, if we just built some storage, it would solve it all, wrong. If we, could, if we just conserved more and recycled more, that would solve it all wrong. It's very complicated. So I'm going to arm you a little bit um, before I dive into a couple other subjects with the key issues. One is most variable hydrology in the country, year to year, location to location, and time of year when it's used. Well, what does that mean? That means most of it falls in the north, most of it's used in the Central Valley and the south in terms of surface water. Uh, you can't count on it in any given year, so it means you need this incredible infrastructure that I'll show you in a minute. It also means storage is not a dirty word. We have to have storage, or modern California would not be possible at all, either agriculture or the economic and social miracle that's Southern California, even if you only like Disneyland, but still. Um, modern California would not exist without incredible infrastructure that is dealing with bringing water from hundreds of miles away from where people are using it um, and getting it there through a very complex system that has to withstand multiple dry years, built more or less, um, I mean, uh, short changes for a, a three-year drought cycle that we had seen in the preceding 100 years, and I'll come back to that. Every area has a totally different mix of sources, so the one thing doesn't work. Some have just surface water, don't have any groundwater. Some have just groundwater. I mean, whatever. Some have all of one and all the others. Some have a mix. Places like Santa Clara Valley Water District or San Diego or the LA area gets water from multiple sources that all come together to give them their uh, water supply. Locally, it can involve uh, stormwater capture, recycling, desal, and a whole host of other things, but it's different everywhere. Um, groundwater can be different from here to the end of that room. So it really, really varies um, pretty significantly, and there's a mix of water rights that people have. Um, during the drought, you probably saw all the pictures of fallowed fields, and there were a lot of it. We have over 500,000 acres fallowed at the height of the drought. But if you had panned a little to the right or the left, you might have seen a very vibrantly green field, meaning one was a senior water rights holder and the other was a junior rights holder, or someone had groundwater and someone else didn't have groundwater, or someone was a senior water rights holder who decided to sell their water that year to a junior water rights holder. So it's very, again, very complicated. So that means that the impact of the drought varied very greatly. It also means the mix of solutions is going to be different. What works for San Diego might be different than what works for LA, would be different than what works for San Francisco. And I spent a lot of time during the drought defending people for doing something that made sense. So example, why does San Diego spend so much money on a desal facility for 7% of their water supply? Because they don't have a groundwater basin that they can put a lot of recycled water or storm water in. San Diego area is also cutting edge on uh, indirect and, and eventually direct potable reuse 
of wastewater. It just depends on what your opportunities are. And when you're at the end of a bunch of pipes, you're going to have to pay more for your water to have a certain amount of security. So it, it shouldn't be judging on one thing. And then, of course, storage, 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 big, small, above ground and below. And our groundwater basins, which I'll talk about in a moment, are the only thing big enough in size to approximate the snowpack that we're going to lose under climate change. And I'll show that to you. So storage becomes very important. And then you have some of these basics here that our agriculture is really significant, one of only five Mediterranean climates that can grow the level of fruits and vegetables that we in the country and other countries rely on. Um, lots of biodiversity. Our institutional setting is very focused on local control. We have thousands of water agencies, 400 um, what are called large ones that... Uh, that have more than 3,000 people in them. So it's a very diffuse thing. And then climate change, as I referred to, is going to be difficult, and I'll show you some pictures, because of that storage that we need, fully a third of it in an average year is in our snowpack. And with just a few degrees temperature rise, uh, we're going to lose it. We'll lose all part, et cetera. Whatever it is, it's going to make all the fights we have now seem like a garden party. Um, because we're not going to have that snowpack to hold the precipitation back. When more flooding in the spring, we'll have less snowpack up there to melt out during the spring and the summer and replenish those reservoirs that aren't full once and then drawn down. They're full and then they're drowned down and then they refill and then they're drowned down and they refill and then we're, they're drowned down. And we're able to recharge our groundwater basins through a slower flow, um, both from reservoirs and from snow melt. So we're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, we're also going to have more population and the like. So just to give you some pictures, because you're sci I'm being sciencey here by showing you pictures. That just shows that we have the most variable hydrology. And there's the variation between wet, dry, normal, just to give you a little bit of a visual about how it varies from year to year. Seasonal differences when it's used and when it falls, not the same time, just to make the point. And then, of course, where it is versus where all the people are. And then don't forget the Colorado River that's coming um, from the, uh, from the east that I don't talk about enough and I can talk about a little more if you want. And so how do we make that work through this incredible system of infrastructure that you know, rivals some of the wonders of the world and have created this economic and agricultural miracle but it was done without thinking about the environmental consequences. And as a result, we've wreaked havoc with the natural ecosystem, particularly in the Delta. It doesn't mean we can't fix it and there are things in process and they are, they are ever thus in process but there actually are a lot of things happening and a lot of things we can do. But this is what makes modern California uh, possible. And now our task is to figure out how to make it also work for the natural environment in a way that is also important to Californians. Because Californians do care about healthy agriculture, they care about healthy urban communities, and they do care about healthy ecosystems. The partisans, maybe not so much. They may pick one over another. But as Californians, this is all part of our heritage and who we are. So here's the scary picture on the bathroom mirror during the drought gives you a sense of what can happen in snowpack and I could show you chapter and verse. It's going to be pretty scary. So what we did as part of the, oh, this one's got animation, I'm sorry, is before the drought was called, because of climate change, the, um, the uh, administration came out with a water action plan. It's not a perfect plan. It's not perfectly written. It's like, it looks like it was, you know, built by committee, even though we all edited each other. I mean, I drafted chapters. You wouldn't believe I drafted. People edited mine. And we came up together with an agreement, a historic agreement, with the Department of Ag, EPA, and Resources on a full-on plan where we were all going to do all of these things. It was an all-of-the-above plan that included safe drinking water for poor communities, which um, had been left behind for so long, but it had conservation first and foremost, because that's Governor Brown put it there. But these were all the things, the, uh, all of the above, get in action versus making it a talking party, because there was no time like the present to get in motion. And it was a very effective political document also because everybody could see their thing in it, so they didn't feel the need to diss somebody else's, and they just, we were sort of in a come with me if you wanna live kind of approach, like we're going on all of this, no sacred cows, come with us, we're not just gonna sit and let you guys debate it, we're gonna do things, and, and we did, and I'll talk about some of that. But then the drought hit, and you can't do a talk in the evening without talking about having Ben Franklin involved, because he's the greatest quote. And I came up with beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. But that wasn't the quote I was looking for. It was when the well's dry, we know the worth of water. And certainly in the drought, the worth of water became really important. So we had that worst drought in modern times. I talked about that more or less um, three-year, four-year drought cycle. Well, Australia had been in that same three or four-year drought cycle. 
and we talked to them because theirs was from, they, they started in 94, 95. And for three years they figured, well, eventually it'll rain. And so it didn't. So they didn't do a lot because they figured it would rain. And then they got to year four, five, and six, and the trees started dying everywhere in the parks. And again, for Australia, you may, you know, we, we have so much um, uh, advertising and commercial stuff here where you think about shrimp on the Barbie or crocodile Dundee or any of those things. Australia, England is the mother country. And where their gardens and their trees started dying, it was the end of civilization as they knew it. And they went nuts. They even came up with trying to plant twice as many trees because they were also worried about the heat island effect um, and the elderly and the like. And they just did everything all at once from gray water to desal to whatnot. And they really did a, a blitz on it, but they spent a lot of money. And um, after that year six, I, did, I don't think I finished my punchline, year six, they finally, it rained a little and they thought they were going to come out of it and then they had the three worst years yet. I should have it, I, I have in other present the chart, just absolutely terrifying. So they did it all and, and we talked to them because they had been in the same drought scenario as us and we started talking to them around year two or three where we were just a little bit worried about it and they said don't wait because theirs lasted 10 or 12 years depending on where you are and if you look at the geophysical record, we've had 40 year and 400 year droughts in California, and so we've probably been in a relatively wet period, and that's kind of lit the fire under us, but we already had that plan, and so we, we pretty much um, accelerated it. Again, just to give you a sense at the nadir of the drought, the statewide snow water content, I think that's 2015, that's pretty pathetic. And then, you know, the snowpack was bad in 2015, but then, you know, a couple years later is high, it's probably pretty much there today, maybe a little bit higher, so you, you can't really count on things coming in any way in any given year. Uh, California's history of drought, um, it's not the drought threshold here that's important, it's this line that says normal conditions. There is no such thing as normal conditions in California. Abnormal is normal. Look at this chart. You can't count on anything to be there, and if you notice, the drought side of this is getting deeper. Does that mean it will always be deep and we won't have flooding? We may yet have flooding this year, but we can't take any year as a harbinger of what the next year is going to be. So what happened in the drought? Well, we had tens of thousands of people out of work. We had people out of water, particularly with shallow wells. We had that 500,000 uh, acres fallowed. Uh, we had fish and wildlife just being hammered um, because the water was hotter. They couldn't get to their refugia because it was dammed, etc. It was really pretty terrible. And many people saw the pictures of Folsom uh, nearly dry. Right now it's, it's full and people forget how dry it could get, but it was a pretty scary sight for the entire Sacramento metropolitan area. And we actually did some emergency rules that, um, that kept the Bureau of Reclamation from taking it below uh, a certain elevation. But if they had gone lower, they probably technically could have, but, and I'll be technical here, it would have scared the shit out of all the people in, in Sacramento. So I think we did it for mental health reasons as much as anything else. Really, I'm just saying. I'm not there anymore. That's, you make decisions. I think one needs to follow the Panetta rule in these situations, which is you make the decision that a reasonable person, a regular Californian would make if they knew what you knew. And to me, it's not just mediating between the expert public in front of you. It's thinking about what is in the interest of the average person in California. At least that's my philosophy about decision making, I think, for most of my colleagues. And what did we do? We did a lot of things. We did a lot of emergency orders. We, some of them we did well. Some of them we didn't. Um, we shortchanged fish on a really big one um, at Shasta, and we lost a second year of... Um, of salmon eggs, which was um, really pretty awful. M would they have been saved had we saved a little more cold water in Shasta? Maybe, maybe not, but I still think we made a mistake not being more cautious there. We delivered water in, uh, in bottles and in tankers, and we, drew, uh, we drilled wells, and we ran pipe, uh, and we did these emergency uh, conservation regs that I talked about, and we put more than a billion dollars in grants and loans into recycled water projects to make the paradigm shift to try and get projects from the drawing board into the ground. Uh, we streamlined rules for outdoor use, agricultural use, indirect potable reuse. We also did aquifer recharge rules and the like, and we're in process on, um, on direct potable reuse regulations. So recycled water has made that paradigm shift and the public is there. Some of it is a demographic change with younger people trusting technology. Some of it was people recognizing that, hey, this is a real source of water. We shouldn't just be flushing out to the sea, particularly along the coast. And there's a lot going on in that. 
Well, what was one of our nemeses? Nemeses? It was El Nino, and it was 2014, 15. The media would say El Nino will save us, and people stop conserving because that oil Nino will save us and you know I was quoted in a, in a subsequent story that I think anybody who reads all my quotes will know I'm from the San Fernando Valley because I think my quote was when people bring up El Nino I'm like no all caps exclamation point and that was in the New York Times much to my chagrin and then I laughed about it but he told me he was doing me a favor because if you sound like a regular person as a public official, he's doing you a favor because most people think public officials aren't regular people. If being a regular person is the score, I am the waters are. That one I'll, I'll cop to. But El Nino didn't come, so it's like the guy on the left. But the wake-up call of all time in this drought is the guy on the right. It was the Godzilla of all wake-up calls. We can't go back to our complacency. We can't just hope that it's going to rain. So looking for something on uh, reality, I went looking for quotes on reality, and this afternoon I found a good one from Ice Cube that I shared with people. But my favorite one is this one from Abraham Lincoln. I'm a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts and beer. So there was beer again, right? So I, you know, late night Googling when you're putting presentation together, I, I'm a bit of a brat, so I actually didn't know that beer was such an important part of our, you know, founding fathers. Um, and so I Googled other people. I Googled John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Ronald Reagan, and beer, each individually, and I got nothing, and I was a little disappointed. But I did get this from Martin Luther, and when I stop, it's a period. Whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep long does not sin. Whoever does not sin enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but as I said, I'm a self-entertaining unit, and I choose to believe it. So here's the reality we've talked about. That loss of snowpack. Population's going to rise. Sea level's going to rise, which is going to complicate things, certainly in the delta, as well as pretty much everywhere, uh, including right down here. The delta is a central challenge to us in our water system. Many of you know this. I won't go through the whole thing, but you know, you, you're right near the, the delta, and the, everybody forgets the San Francisco Bay part of the Bay Delta, but you've got the Sacramento coming down, the San Joaquin coming up, Sacramento's uh, two or three times, depending on the season or year, as much flow, and it goes through this fragile web of islands with uh, peat soils and farming down below, um, and the fish get totally confused. And you have these big pumps at the bottom for the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project, which incidentally are junior water contractors for supplemental water that normally get the headlines as if that's all the water. They are big, but they are uh, junior water rights holders that, um, that help in the, in the Central Valley and Southern California um, that reverse flows and just confuse fish. Just think about the life of a, of a salmon trying either to, in that wonderful return where they smell their way home or as salmon smolts trying to navigate a sea of predators. We've also diverted so much of the water there that um, it doesn't function as an estuary. And I don't know that any estuary has functioned um, well with that much water diverted on some of these tributaries on the Sacramento and on the San Joaquin. 80 to 90 percent of the flow is diverted at critical times of the year for fish. And you wonder why we have a... Um, a problem. But is this just a Southern California and a, uh, and a Central Valley problem? No. The Bay Area is just as dependent for its water supplies on the Delta. They just take it above the Delta. So they're not subject to that issue with the pump, but they are taking water out of the Delta that the ecosystem sorely needs as well. And I always feel it's important to say that up here, not just because I'm from LA, but um, <laughs> like for sure. Um, I, didn't, I had to leave because I didn't speak that way, really. Um, but, but the Bay Area is as much a part of it as anyone. It's just that they don't have the pumps issue going for them. And the reality is that fish and wildlife are imperiled. You see that curve and you see the, the, the challenge. And some of those higher peaks are two and a half years after we have a lot of flow. So there's a correlation I'll show you. Just another picture because a better picture with other fish. But ag is a precious resource, so we can't just wipe it away. Uh, groundwater uh, is a huge problem. I talked about this too fast earlier, but if you look at this picture, it's iconic, and someone's tried to update it. 
the, at the bottom of that telephone pole, it's 1977 is the picture. Midway up, it says 1955. Up near the top, it says 1925. That was where the land surface was in those years because in parts of the Central Valley, so much has been pumped in some places. It's more that, um, that uh, infrastructure has buckled, the storage that was allowed to, you know, that could be in there um, that was pulled in uh, gets depleted if it's clay soils. They squish and they don't pop back like a sponge. Um, and uh, it, as someone pointed out today in a later conversation that I had, uh, folks have been mining fossil groundwater for a long time, and not just for droughts. Droughts are when you would want to pump groundwater. Non-droughts are when you should be conserving it in the ground. And frankly, our groundwater basins are the only thing that can approximate and size the snowpack. That we're, there's no way you could build enough more dams to do it. In little places, maybe you could. Off-stream storage like sites, perhaps, raising Los Vaqueros. But there's no way. We've already dammed all the major streams that we're going to dam, and we've seen the consequences of doing that. So groundwater storage becomes most important, which is why the administration put so much political muscle into getting the first ever statewide framework for groundwater management uh, in 2014, the last Western state to have one, uh, but presumably one that will be good. And this just gives you a sense with some of the NASA data of what happened even over a few years in terms of the depletion of our groundwater. And that's robbing from the future, which a lot of farmers understood, not at microphones, but as I said earlier today, in coffee shops and bars where they would grab my arm and say, you guys have to do this, just don't say I told you so. Because they knew if they wanted their grandchildren to farm, there had to be a way to hold back, but it was very hard to say so um, in the political culture. We also have an incredible problem of contaminated groundwater. If you're in a large major area, it's not as big a problem because you can afford to blend it with other sources, you can treat it, you can afford that. If you're on a small domestic well or a small system in the Central Valley in a rural area, you can't afford to treat it, and it is a, a really a chilling and, and challenging problem that uh, this, the new governor has made a priority and Governor Brown made a priority and we made an awful lot of um, progress legislatively and otherwise and helped thousands of people, particularly at East Porterville, but not just in East Porterville who were out of water and were drinking crappy water even when they had water to have fresh, clean water. And I think it's the issue of our time and it's a huge fight in the legislature. Our infrastructure is aging and inadequate. We know that. We could definitely use less water than we do. We were talking about this uh, at lunch. There's, there's, there's all kinds of ways. They do have flumes and pipes like this still in existence. There are areas that lose 60 to 70% of their water to leaks, even today, and up to 30% in your major urban area. So we now are doing leak rules and all of that. We got a lot of legislation on that. And the reality is we can do a lot better through integrated water management, looking at the, mo the molecule of water from the top of the watershed all the way down, using the same dollar and the same activity to help fish, to have flood control and the like. And there's been a lot happening on that. We can learn from Australia. We can learn from Israel. We, we're not facing an existential crisis. We can learn a lot from what they did. They're different than us. Australia is different than us, but there's a lot that we went to learn. And we have to move to what David Sedlak calls water to. 4.0, where we're actually integrating stormwater, recycled water, desal as appropriate, surface water, groundwater, et cetera, and thinking less profligately about how we use water. As I said, a, a lot of stuff happened. I've mentioned a lot of a lot of water bonds. Thank you very much for the folks who voted um, for them. A lot of improvements in our water rights system, which um, largely we focused on measurement and reporting and enforcement um, to lay a foundation for having a rational conversation about our water rights system and to see if we could get it to work. We now have long-term water efficiency legislation that will put fair targets, not percentages. We did pretty well on the percentages, but based on population, a reasonable amount indoors, a reasonable amount outdoors to shoot for, which will make water agencies have to integrate efficiency, which is the most cost-effective in the long run and the least climate uh, 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 greenhouse gas inducing way to go because even a recycled water facility takes a lot of energy. Folks who, I, I ran a public works agent, it is fun to build stuff. I got a hard hat collection, I got golden shovels, I got golden scissors. It's fun and you have engineering firms and I love engineering firms. I may go work for one but I really like engineering firms but it's fun to build stuff but efficiency is the cheapest, fastest, smartest and most efficient from a, a climate we got a lot of that passed, really. More legislation passed in the last five years than the last 50 on water. We did a lot on the water action plan. I talked to you, a lot of agreements on salt and sea, 
Klamath and the Colorado River agreements and I put my little asterisk as bites nails across his fingers because those things are always tough. And then a lot on Delta, which I'll talk about for a moment. And also importantly, and I'll get to this, the myriad individual acts at the local level of transcending those traditional silos, whether it's city to county, wastewater program to drinking water program, parks department, flood control, et cetera. There are different, different planets. Many people talk about silos, some call them silos of excellence, but it is really important and it is really hard for folks to do it. So we did a lot of regulation that would incentivize people doing that hard work on stormwater permits and the like. There were all kinds of drought angels that didn't get written about where farmers helped other neighbors by running pipe and drilling wells and sharing. There were all kinds of fish farmer win-wins I don't have time to talk about, but they were fantastic, particularly with the rice guys and in the Delta where people voluntarily um, took cuts to even senior water rights because they didn't want to be seen as a neighborly Floodplains, the Central Valley uh, floodplain plan now talks about you do using floodplain set-asides for flood control, not just always building higher levees uh, and higher dams, et cetera, and the Groundwater Management Act. But the big test of our time is going to be what we do on Bay Delta, and that is very much in process right now. I mean, here's the 22 TRIBs on the Sacramento side. Uh, there are three on the lower San Joaquin. The upper San Joaquin is a big deal, but it's the subject of a settlement agreement um, that is in practice, so we wanted to let that be, and the water board is updating, finished updating standards on the lower San Joaquin, is working, has put out a framework, and is working on them for the 22 TRIBs on the Sacramento and through uh, Delta, which is a big deal. Are we going to be able to share the rivers and share the Delta with other species. And frankly, there are plenty of fights between water users too, but it's easier to pick on a fish. Their interests are not aligned. Again, I showed you fish tanking. Um, also, why do flows matter? I talked about how two and a half years after high flows, you see a, a, an amazing abundance of returning salmon, except for this one year on the slide that had really terrible ocean conditions. That's not to say you need to mimic these really high flows. That's not what the proposal is. The proposal says, let's do a percentage of unimpaired flow to share the water um, between the ecosystem and water users in a way that'll mimic the natural hydrograph in nature and will actually mimic the things and the cues that fish and wildlife and the whole ecosystem, because it's not just about fish, it's about fish food, it's about little critters, all those things that we talked about in some of our meetings, all the, whether it's a diapon or a cocoa, it's everything. That whole ecosystem evolved on a certain pattern of flows, which people don't see anymore because after a, a dry period, because they don't have to share it, storages are refilled and people want to refill it as fast as they can, and the fish see dry years three times as often as the rest of us do. So figuring out how to share it year to year can really, um, can really help. And what are those benefits? It's not just to give a water slide to the fish as the talking points have or that we're blinded by flow. It's because they have temperature benefits and cooler water benefits the native species over the invasives. It has to do with their metabolism. It also ends up helping on the tributaries and downstream. It activates floodplain and habitat because it wets the side. It gives them a place to hide. It gives them a place to rest. It gives them a, a food source. It makes a difference and it advantages the natives over the predators. I'm overly simplifying it, but it's very important. And so what we proposed was our, our science said, for example, on the San Joaquin, that if we shared it 60 ecosystem, 40 water users, we knew that'd be great for fish. And we had to do that report uh, in 2010. All, everything peer reviewed, everything looked at. But what we proposed was 30 to 50% starting at 40. Again, leave 40 in, you can still take 60 out, you can manage it as a block of water. This is certain months of the year. And if you add those non-flow things, like floodplain restoration, lowering it so it gets inundated at a lower level, if you did predator suppression like filling hot spots or taking away lights or bridges or places where they hide and snack on the, um, on the smolts as they go by or the smelt, um, we would give you a discount and let you go down as low as 30 getting 70% of it, leaving 30 in. Now, some of the environmental community thought we went too far. Folks in the water user community thought we were 
crazy and that we were trying to destroy agriculture and the urban economy for fun, when in fact our job is to find that balance. As I said this, this afternoon, there's no sweet spot here. Our job is to maximize all of the interests, whether it's ag or hydro or recreation or fish and wildlife. We tend to talk about fish and wildlife the most because they're the ones that are shorted and they're the ones that we end up not being able to help. And they are all many of them uh, on the brink of extinction because we haven't been able to get past the talk and get into action. So I'm happy that the board was actually able to vote uh, on the first part. I'm also happy that folks are now engaged in active settlement discussions that need a lot more substance, but it's way better than the is so, is not, you're a jerk, no, I'm not, six years that people spent picking on us or yelling at us or miscasting what it was we did. There are people now engaged and that is a good thing. Again, I talked about that. There's the lower that we did. And I talked about the flexibility. And the agreements need to have just, they need comparable benefits. And my staff, people think it's just the bottom. They want it because they know we could do the perfect plan. We could do the 60% or it's 75% actually on the Sacramento. We could do the perfect plan and it's not self-implementing. We implement it through conditions on water rights, which is a quasi-judicial proceeding that can take years with hundreds of parties. So if you have a deal that people have agreed to, it's more likely to happen, it's more ha likely to happen fast, but it's gotta be robust, transparent, and verifiable. It has to be real, not just a punt. And right now we're in that substance period. Some people thinking it's terrible and a bunch of empty pages, and there were a lot of empty pages, but it's a good start. They take the yes for an answer. We had senior, I'm looking at Greg, because you know this. We had senior water rights holders standing up and offering us water. Was it enough? Well, maybe not, but for a senior water rights holder to offer a drop to the water board without us not resting it from their cold, dead fingers in a lawsuit, pretty impressive. So I give those guys a purple heart because they got a lot of grief from other water rights holders. So I want to go with that yes and get to the right answer. And we know that these agreements can work. We've seen it in other contexts. We've done it in the Yuba Accord. We've seen... Um, I'll make it move forward. We've seen the stuff that the rice guys have done with birds, where they were the scourge in terms of herbicides and pesticides and rice straw burning, where they were also polluting the air, particularly in the Sac Valley. And they've totally turned around. And if you go to their annual conferences, they talk about birds and fish for 80% of the meeting, and they're proud of it. And there are amazing examples there, and they want to try and do some stuff for fish too. So we know there are folks out there, and there are folks on the San Joaquin and the Delta that want to, and they're working on things like how to get water onto the floodplain, even get fish onto the floodplain, but at least get water onto the floodplain. They can then get back in the river so there's some food for fish. And they talk about the difference in size of these smolts if they have a chance to chow down and rest up. It's pretty impressive. It's not snapping a finger. Okay, so how do we get this all to happen? And that's attitude, and that's gonna be the last piece I wanna talk about. There's a lot of talk, as I said, in water, and that's theoretical. So it's spring training, so I can go back to baseball. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. And what I like are the practitioners and figuring out how to reward practitioners. But figuring out how to do that takes a lot of work. In, I was a Chinese studies major in college, and they have a phrase that I won't say in, um, in Chinese, because there are probably people who speak Chinese, and you'll bust me for my tones being bad. But it's like they say like a chicken talking to a duck that people are talking to each other in the same language, but they can't hear each other. And that's just an awareness that people need to have. I call this the challenge of ego system management rather than eco system management. I talked about it at some length um, earlier today, which is that people are not dealing with each other like humans. And that, that means the humans in the negotiating room or the humans that may disagree with you. But if you can figure out how to find common ground, then you can get to agreement. And that hasn't happened in water anywhere near enough. And what does that take? It takes things like asking a question versus just repeating a talking point back. Because at least half the time I found to my chagrin that when I want to retort to somebody who I really don't like what they said, I hold it back, I do that three second rule, and I ask them a question at least half the time, maybe more, they didn't mean what I thought they meant. So I was just wasting that entire interaction. And this kind of training should actually be mandatory. I mean, I'll just tell you, I have a million stories, but I'll just tell you one in China where, well, no, I'll tell you one that's about EPA because it's more apropos to this. When I got into EPA, there's a big fight over smog check and inspection and maintenance. And the US EPA wanted se to separate test and repair because there was fraud, where people would give you a fake pass because they want you to come back for repairs. 
So they wanted to totally separate, which is a massive undertaking that was fraught with danger. And the folks in California, both Democrats and Republicans, hated it. So I got my job earlier than anybody else because it was a war zone and immediately got sent out to try and negotiate. And so I went, I met with my staff, but I just went to Sacramento and I interviewed all of the legislators that were mad at us. And I talked to one in particular named Newt Russell. And he said, I said, why are you guys so mad? Because they weren't just not wanting to do it. They were, it was pretty nasty. And he said, well, because EPA wants, you know, insert stupid thing. Because he just assumed that EPA was going to do something stupid because their experience about EPA was that it had done stupid things. And that had been my experience too, frankly, and which part of the reason I went to EPA when I had been both an environmentalist and a, um, a discharger when I ran the Public Works Department. It just didn't seem like they were connected with the context on the ground, which is why I wanted to show up and find out what's going on. And I said, well, you know, Senator, I know that's what you've been told by the administration and by the, the smog check folks, but actually EPA is not requiring that. They prefer it. I can tell you why, but I can actually negotiate a deal that's not that. And he said, no, EPA is requiring, you know, insert this stupid thing. And I said, no, no, I understand everybody's been telling you that, but actually EPA, and EPA does prefer it, but it's not mandatory and you know, it, you, you can have, we can come up with another system. And he thought for a minute, and then he said, no, EPA is requiring, and I thought back to another story I didn't tell you about when I was in China, and people couldn't understand me, and they couldn't understand me because they assumed I couldn't speak Chinese, so they couldn't hear me when I did. And um, I pulled my ID tag out with my picture on it that said EPA in big letters with that stupid logo. And I said, honestly, Senator, I swear to God I work at EPA now, and we're not requiring it. And he sat back and he went, oh, well then. And that was the breakthrough in the negotiation. But until we did that, <laughs> it, was, it was a little crazy. Just, just an example. I mean, women have these stories where they've said funny things or smart things in a room and haven't been heard because people assume they wouldn't have anything smart or funny to say. That may be dated. Men with Southern accents apparently have the same experience. But our dialogue <laughs> is a problem in making these assumptions. And you've got to work at it. You've got to get in front of someone's face and speak very slowly and say things like, I am speaking Chinese now, in which case they go, ah, you know, and then they can hear you. But, it's, it's, <laughs> but that happens in everyday life. And, and if you go home and I help you with your marriage or your significant other, you're welcome, because that does happen a lot. <laughs> so there is a problem with our dialogue. Here's one side of the picture. Stop the regulatory drought you farm, we eat, any questions, which you can drive up the five and you'll see it. But it's not really any better on the other side. It happens on both sides. And I was defending the lowly almond and even bottled water and new development and even fracking during the drought because people were picking on it in a way that actually wasn't relevant to the drought. They, these things have other issues. There's no question about it. But it wasn't really um, apt. And it's due to this lack of water literacy. And so to get there, our relationship with water has to evolve. LA, which people who've seen Chinatown think they understand, um, has actually... You know, it was 88% dependent on MET for Delta and Colorado River water during the drought. That's bad. The, this is the mayor standing with the head of DWP and the former head of Heal the Bay vowing to cut LA's uh, use of imported water in half in 10 years. Pretty incredible. And they are off to the races there. And they just came out with something two weeks ago that they're going to recycle 100% of their wastewater in the next 20 years. And that's a big deal. That's my plant, and I wanted them to do more. And our relationship with each other has to evolve in order to make that happen. And what will it take? Like, you don't have to be Councillor Troy, although I probably am Councillor Troy, um, but you, um, or Nelson Mandela, but we need to take a breath. We need to stop and listen to each other. We need to think about doing this as Californians and deal with those human skills, not just our professional skills, our advocacy skills, our science, but really connect with people. And you, that's the only thing that ever makes these things break through. And again, we don't need to argue our case like Perry Mason, and we don't yet need to be the Dalai Lama, because none of us can be the Dalai Lama, but we need to figure out how to understand other people, even if we disagree with them. And so we get there through this clear-eyed focus on the decades ahead of us, which are terrifying, versus the decades behind us. We have to focus on reality versus rhetoric, the practical versus the theoretical. Embrace that complexity and act versus being in stasis, value convergence over conflict, which our society really does not. 
financially to be sure, and taken all of the above or either or view, and that all of these things, north and south, delta and the projects, agriculture and safe drinking water, ag and urban, are all part of California that we need to, um, we need to embrace. And just talking louder and slower at each other is certainly not gonna get us where we need to go. But if we do all those things, we're off to the races. So with that, happy to take your questions. I got I to gotta get some coffee slides because people are going to think all I do is talk about alcohol, which uh, <laughs> So I think, um, I think those of you who have been here before know that we, um, we have a session here with our graduate students. Two of our graduate students are going to interview Felicia oh, yeah. for a, a few minutes. And then after that, we'll open up the audience to all of you. So that's what the program is coming up. I'm going to introduce you. I'm a little you nervous about what's second. behind the curtain. Yeah, oh, it's a big reveal. Um, there's some there's some high stools, they're not high chairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no food throwing. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, our two graduate students, uh, Gina Ayala over here. She works with uh, Dr. Kathy Boyer, um, wetland restoration work, um, and then uh, Austin Garrity, who works with Dr. Wim Kimmerer, and he works up in the Delta, so he's pretty familiar with uh, some of the fish and water and so issues. And am Felicia, I supposed to go here? Have a okay, seat cool. there. There, I'll get him to go here so I can actually see okay, you. Okay, and I'm going to give the microphone over to Austin and. Wonderful. Is this on? Can everybody hear me? Great, great. Thank you, Felicia, so much for speaking with us this evening. It's been wonderful times meeting with you in the afternoon and, and again um, here with the public. So I, I as, as, as Karina's mentioning, you know, I'm a graduate student here. I work with WIM. I work with the Delta. And um, one aspect of, of me being a graduate student, I'm interested in how um, my science can be helpful to inform policy decisions. So I want to ask you, working with scientists, what are some aspects of the communication that have been good, mm -hmm. and where can scientists improve on? Uh, that, that's a great question. I think this is one of Wim's gifts. He's probably the most popular scientist um, in the public policy arena because he's really smart, and yet he's accessible. So I think, I think one of the things that's most helpful is when Scientists, you don't, it's not dumbing it down, but take the time to think about, it, it's up a piece of what I said, the time to figure out how to translate their work and make it understandable and relevant to the policymakers who aren't, don't have the PhDs or the advanced degrees or understand that language. I, I had um, one of my staff is like a really, he's since retired, um, had real issues with me and I couldn't really understand what they were. And because he just always looked so grumpy when he was in a meeting with me. And he would come in and slap down a chart or a graph as if I could understand the axes and, and read the chart. And I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of smart, but I'm not science smart. I didn't take a lot of those. I mean, it took me a while to even figure out what an exceedance plot is, and I can't explain it now. But it took me a while to understand it. People would just slap it up. And one of the really good scientists who was very accessible and would explain things and sort of, he wasn't patronizing, but he would explain the axes and he would say what the chart meant. And he would talk about what he knew and what he didn't know in a way that helped us understand the complexity of it. And he was retiring. I said, what's gonna, what's, who's going to explain these charts to me? Because I felt bad that I didn't understand them in dealing with the staff. Not that I didn't think I was stupid, but I felt like they would feel I was disrespectful, but I honestly didn't understand them. And, he, and I said, for example, I could never, I could never um, understand why Larry always seemed so unhappy with me. And he said, because he, he came back from a meeting with me, and, and I asked him how it went, and he said, all she said was that the chart looked like a dolphin. <laughs> because that's all I could see <laughs> in the chart. So the thing for scientists, have some compassion for non-scientists and figure out how to translate it so we understand why it should do it. And I think that's something that doesn't just happen. Over the past 30 years, I've probably been on panels on it and even, you know, locked at the Queen Mary working sessions on it where you'd have the policymakers and the scientists. This was at the National Estuary Program. Not an estuary, but in the estuary program. Still, I am proud of that. It's all, it's all fair. And the... Um, and we did a lot of good with it, but we were focused on how to write this report, and the scientists said it should be one way, and we were the policy people saying it should be the other way, and finally I said, why don't we just write it both ways, because we want people to understand the science of it, but we have to have a policy document to try and get something done, 
for the bay. So that's how we resolved that one, which was probably less efficient than it could be, but it took us till the second day to even get to that. So again, it's, it's like that chicken talking to a duck issue, which is as scientists spending time to figure out how to make the science accessible to the public would be great, but to decision makers. Because I think what ends up happening is in the absence of the substance of the science being accessible to decision makers, let alone the media, politics overwhelms. And folks who are good at the media and invest in the media and the simple soundbite win the day far more often than they should. Great. Long answer, but I've been thinking about that one for a few decades. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. So you've just shown us how variable California's climate has been and will continue to be. And I'm wondering how easy it is to get um, legislation passed in drought versus in flood years. Well, we'll probably have legislation about floods during the flood years, I think. Um, I, I think uh, we got a lot done and we went for it during the drought. I mean, uh, the groundwater legislation is not going to have an impact for years down the road. It was more for the next set of droughts, but the public consciousness was higher about droughts. It's higher about floods. I like to think that Californians' water literacy went up during the course of the drought, and we spent a lot of time with the media explaining things to them and then teeing up, particularly our reports on urban water use, so that every month there was a story they could write, so you would have a story. Now, sometimes I didn't like the story, but a lot of times it got out there, and I actually found that going straight to the public was more effective than just working with the water agencies, some present company accepted that's in the room. But um, a, a lot of folks in the, in the uh, water agencies were inconvenienced by what we did, and some of it was significant. It was a, a, a disruption. We just chose that disruption in case we were in a 10-year drought, and we chose the water agencies being mad at us over that, and, and then having rain and having been wrong, to the entire California public being mad at us for letting people hemorrhage water on their lawns if we were going to be in a 10-year drought. So we just chose which one it was. But we went to town on all the legislation that we thought we could get through within reason. But during, um, even though we've had a really wet year, those conservation numbers have held. There's still about half what people did during the worst drought in modern history. They haven't, people, there's drought memory. So I think we can keep doing more, like we got the um, water efficiency legislation through last year. I'm just going to grab some water. <coughs> Too much talking. <laughs> I want to take, it to get on the take a step back, and um, you mentioned working for the EPA as mm -hmm. a prior employment, and really want to ask, um, you played a, a super important role in having the X2 salinity standard mm -hmm. adopted for, for the Delta. Can you talk about what is X2, and how did you get all the water agencies on board with this? The magic of Patrick Wright, who's now at the Tahoe Conservancy, and really good people who did a lot of talking. We spent a lot of time doing science-based convenings. We did, when, in the 90s, when we were doing the Bay Delta Accord work and the follow-on agreements, it, it was, it, as you may recall, during the Clinton administration, it was the meet with everybody consensus, do a lot of stuff place-based and local, which worked for me. That's why I got my job, that's sort of, that's... I was really young. I was, yeah. I was only... I was, I, I mean, as you, some of you remember, some of you definitely remember, please remember. Um, but in the Clinton administration, we were, we were very much about connection and, uh, and community and all that. So we did a lot of death by meeting, pretty much. Different than in the Delta Reform Act in 09, it was more shuttle diplomacy. And in the voluntary settlement agreements has been a lot of closed door and shuttle diplomacy and those doors and windows are starting to open now which is great and uh, appropriate timing but we did we did death by meeting I mean we're practically related that's why I left for seven years I came back and I knew I could give you everybody's talking points because they were still doing it because we spent so much time on it and before there was the CalFed the California federal agreement we had club fed which was harder where we had the federal agencies trying to talk to each other. And as people who work in this field know, sometimes your relationships with your sibling agency at your level of government is way more fraught than with the other guys. So Fish and Wildlife and EPA, not like this particularly, NIMFS neither. And we'd get surprised and we tried to get the federal house in order because the state was saying, why should we move if you guys are just gonna give us a late hit? So it, we spent a lot of time 
together we did a lot of meetings on the science and um, X2 was a, a, a you know proxy for when the salinity needed to be in order for there to be enough flow and that just was um, um, something we had enough science on and people agreed on and we had to do because we were doing water quality plan this is where the federal government stepped in to the state's role because the state had failed to do an adequate plan over the decades in fact the first time the state has done an adequate plan without EPA breathing down its neck was a couple months ago when we did the um, lower San Joaquin it was actually fairly historic and important to me because I was the EPA breathing down their neck where we had to we had to do the the plan, but the goal was to get the state back into the driver's seat because we couldn't implement it on a water quality control plan. And so it just ended up, I'm not giving you the best scientific reason, it just was the nature of the conversations we were able to have. It dealt with salinity, which is a water quality issue and flow. And so it was in um, the federal government's wheelhouse, whereas uh, flow in terms of water rights definitely is not under the Wallop Amendment. So we sort of went to that place. Plus salinity is important for agriculture and export water for uh, urban and ag, both in the Delta and outside. So it was a fairly common standard that we were using. Hey, thank you for sharing. But death by meeting works wonders. <laughs> if there, and if you bring candy, it helps too. Just depends. So we are both students of an interdisciplinary program here at EOS. And I'm wondering what tools you have used to cross disciplines and be so successful in that? Well, I think, it, you know, it's interesting coming out of local government because in local government, it's all up close and personal. So you can't, you can have your little silo of excellence, but the other one's right next to you and the city council's just down the hall and it's all very messy. I mean, people in the federal government sometimes have a harder time connecting to real people and real problems because they're more specialized and they're further away from the, um, people, frankly, and the state level is sort of midway between the two. You can still be theoretical about it. When you're at local level, it's up close and personal. And, and my, for me, personally, the epiphany was this epiphany of seeing people as people as opposed to their role. Because I was one of the founders and the lawyer of a group called Heal the Bay down in Los Angeles. So I was a lawyer suing the city for years um, before I ended up running the wastewater program, which whoever thought that would happen. But it was... Um, it was really uh, both a judge and then um, uh, folks from a consulting firm. We were talking about Montgomery Watson. Um, it was Don Smith and um, Frank Grant. I don't know if you ever knew either of them, but they said, why don't we just talk to them? So we sat down and they started answering our questions and we started to get to know the engineers and we realized that our rhetoric, this was my epiphany as you know, an advocate and a lawyer, that the way we talked you would think that we thought that the operators at the Hyperion sewage treatment plant went to work every morning to manufacture sewage for the fun of dumping it in the bay. <laughs> That's what we sounded like, as opposed to being these hardworking, underpaid, underfunded guys dealing with a river of human waste coming at them 24 hours a day that is the size of the sixth largest river in California with inadequate resources. It's just that mindset shift. And so for me and for all my colleagues, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened relatively quickly once folks met with us, we realized this whole issue of you actually need to talk to people and that you need to find out what they're doing. Even learning to translate between engineers and humans, that is one of my specialties. <laughs> and for that, I, I highly recommend Myers-Briggs because engineers like it, right? Because it's in a grid. When I was at EPA, I learned how to put my thoughts on a board and then... Bill's going to know this. Um, I don't know if I ever did it with Bill. That I would learn to put words up on a board and then draw a matrix around it. You could see people's shoulders relax. <laughs> so you have to learn how to. But and if you do, you know, you can kind of get to um, agreement, and you can realize if you know, for example, that, that even the difference between introverts and extroverts, and a lot of folks, not all, but a lot in the sciences are introverts. That the fact that you're talking and they're not smiling and looking at you, they're doing the Easter Island thing, doesn't mean they don't like it. It doesn't mean they didn't hear you. It's just they don't emote the way I'm like smiling, emoting, and laughing, and going, uh-huh, when people are talking. So I get more credit than I deserve. They get less than they deserve. So you just, it's just realizing that and overcoming in enough situations where the people you thought were the enemy that they really just were coming at it from another 
uh, place. So I think we all need to be Margaret Meads and social workers to try and figure out how to reach, I mean, sometimes you can't, sometimes people just are total jerks. I mean, I'm not <laughs> Pollyanna about it, but there are a lot of people that I would have written off as jerks or that they didn't want to do things that really within the world they were in were totally good and felt very, a lot of folks in ag feel terrible that they're demeaned as polluters or that they grow food and fiber that sustains us, but people, and I come out in the environmental community, talk about them as if they go to farm so that they can pour nitrates into the groundwater and steal water from a fish. They're trying to do a socially productive thing that has an externality, so figuring out how to find a better way to do it takes, you know, some compassion, which is why I always put the Dalai Lama up, because we all need reminders to be, if he can be compassionate towards people, I don't know what I'm complaining about, you know, so it's a good model. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Those are great questions. So we're going to open up the, uh, to the audience now for questions, and uh, uh, Austin and Gina will bring the microscope. Uh, microscope. <laughs> <laughs> I That's drank too perfect. many glasses of wine. Uh, yeah. The microphone, <laughs> over to you. So please raise your hand if you have a question for Felicia. You had mentioned that. Uh, you mentioned that LA was going to go to 100% recycling of their wastewater, mm -hmm. and I assume that means the Hyperion plant. Hyperion, Tillman, LA Glendale, and Terminal Island. Do you have any idea what their timeline is on that? I think it's 20 years, more or less, maybe a little less. It could be 15. I couldn't remember. I have it on a slide I didn't use. I think it's 2035. So they're planning to do that, but they're also planning to integrate that with stormwater capture and the like, um, which is a pretty big deal in terms of coastal, because if the, it, it's sort of not always great to reclaim water upstream because sometimes you're taking water back that a fish could use. So coastal wastewater disposal doesn't do any good to anybody, including the ocean, so that's sort of the low-hanging fruit. That'll be a huge impact when it happens. Yeah, it'd be fantastic. Expensive, though. It'll be expensive, but it'll, be, it'll give them more resilience and less dependence on the Delta and the Colorado. And I didn't talk about the Colorado, but they've been in drought for a decade. They just have a lot more storage, so it's been able to go longer than we do because of the, the nature of their canyons and how long the river is. But I'd be more worried about the Colorado if I were in L.A. than the Delta, frankly. Not that either are a picnic, but... Hi. Oh, um, hi. Oh, sorry. My name's Izzy Shapanyak. I'm a San Francisco State alum. And um, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I'm glad that you uh, talked about the human needs versus the needs of the other species that we share the state water resources with. Uh, one of the biggest uh, controversies with respect to water right now are the Twin Tunnels. Mm -hmm. And it's so controversial that successive Democratic administrations have different attitudes toward it. Right. So my question is this. Um, in terms of the needs of the other species as opposed to human needs, would the twin tunnels really serve a purpose? Um, I have to talk theoretically about that because I was a judge on the water rights petition and I'm barred under the Political Reform Act from talking about our deliberations. I was telling some people earlier, for the rest of my life, it's worse than being a judge but my staff gave me these little emergency cards I can call if I need to talk to somebody because they're the only ones I can talk to. And I can only talk to them about what happened up until my last day of work. But as I was discussing with Andy earlier, I think I can now hear from people because I'm not going to be the judge on it. So it's, it's very confusing. So let me just say theoretically what the arguments are because these are all arguments that people have said. The theory behind it, and again, there's theory and there's practice. The theory is a pretty logical one, which is part of what's messing with the fish are the reverse flows are being drawn into those pumps. If you take the water higher up on the Sacramento, which has a lot more water, you can take more water without disturbing those reverse flows. Now, there are impacts at the place you take the water to, so you've got to figure out how to deal with that. But if you don't dewater the system, in theory, 
and that's the, the proposal. It's why Fish and Wildlife Service agencies have always been for it. They were for it when the original pumps were built. They said, don't put them there, that's stupid. The original idea was a peripheral canal, and they didn't do it for lack of funds. It would have been better had they done it at the time. But there are a, a number of issues. There's that plumbing issue, where that piece of plumbing could definitely help at some level or size. There's also the issue of how much water goes into it. So if our issue is that we've already taken too much and we gotta leave more, you can't, people are afraid that it'll be used as a more efficient way to dewater the system. Currently, at the current pumps, you could take 15,000 cubic feet per second of water, and folks don't because of the rules. You, know, you can argue on the, the margins. In, in that proceeding in front of the State Water Board, which is now on a stay per the um, request of the new governor who wants to study it and decide how he wants to proceed, um, the board has, you know, has been hearing from people, it has three choices. One is approve as submitted, and the approval as submitted has some modest increases in flows off the, um, the current plan, not anywhere as near as much as the proposals that the board has. Um, but you, you know, they want a, 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 a take it as, as proposed. The other option is no as proposed, to make a decision, and people have argued that you just can't do it, you can't trust it, It'll, you know, even if the, the board put conditions on it, those could be changed and waived in a moment. These are really hard positions that, you know, make sense, you could argue, the, again, I'm a lawyer, so I could argue anything, but you can argue both of those. The third thing, and the thing that happens most often, is yes with conditions. And so would it be up to the board to do, based on evidence in the record, which is the trick, not based on what Felicia would do if she were designing the project, but based on evidence in the record, is to put conditions on it that would protect other water rights holders. And again, the arguments are always fish versus people, but frankly, there are like 53 protestants, and most of them are other water agencies, because they're worried about being advantaged or disadvantaged. But you could put conditions on that protected their legitimate water rights, not everything they want, but whatever their legitimate water rights are, and that it won't hurt fish and wildlife. And that has to do with flow and construction and other things. And that, that's the big task in front of the board if it's not given that set of conditions. And we encourage people to give us conditions all the way along. It'll probably all come, most of it will come in the, the final briefs that have not yet been um, put in because there's not a final EIR yet and there's the, now this reconsideration. Um, but there's an additional thing in the Delta Reform Act that required the board in 2010 to do the flow criteria report to say what kind of flows the fish really need and that there has to be a condition put on water fix before the permit can be issued of how much flow it could use, even though that will be a placeholder, because by the time the thing's built in 15 years, you'll probably have a whole nother iteration of a water quality control plan and you would have to update conditions. But the idea in the legislation was to let the environmental community know that fish would be protected, but also to let the water user community know how much water they were likely to get before they built this multi-billion dollar project. So in, in answer to your question, in theory, it could be a way to divert the same amount of water with less impact and conceivably divert a little bit more because the biological opinions that we've had that shut the pumps down when smelt are near it or when um, salmon are going by, I'm oversimplifying it, wouldn't wouldn't be in, it wouldn't be prohibiting the export. So that's all in theory, in practice, you know, there's a lack of trust and you'd need to have conditions and you'd need to have conditions that people felt would actually be honored over time. So there's a lot of human dynamic in it as well. And all of that is all on the record. That's not anything I couldn't explain. And I've explained it on YouTube before I was the hearing officer, you could find it. A marvelous talk. Hi. When I was a kid being brought up in New Zealand, almost every domestic house and many commercial buildings had water tanks out the back yeah. that collected water right. off the roofs. Right. I noticed in your talk tonight, you mentioned wastewater, but you didn't get up to the roof. Right. And uh, Sacramento has mandated new solar panels for all new buildings in California, and there are tax benefits for retrofitting solar panels on old houses. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do the same with water tanks? 
Well, we could. I mean, I think it's interesting because water tends to be handled more locally than um, it necessarily needs to. I had this conversation earlier today. I mean, part of the trick with uh, cisterns or with the water tanks is that you, you need to have a big enough one to capture... It doesn't rain that often here, that variable hydrology, particularly where the water's most used in Southern California, they don't get a lot of rain. So you'd be spending a lot of money on a tank that might fill once and help somebody for a month. So it's a big investment. But that doesn't mean it's not happening. Tree People um, has been pushing this, and they, they went to Australia. I probably went to New Zealand, too, um, to look at that. And they've, they've got, you know, they've been focusing on more doing the giant cisterns underground that's capturing the big storm water flows. And L.A. is starting to do that in whole neighborhoods. You know, they've got, they've taxed themselves uh, half a billion dollars in L.A. and they've done a ton of projects. The whole county just passed a measure that's going to give $300 million a year forever to be able to do these capture greening projects, big cisterns, like under a whole park the way they did in, um, I saw the ones in Melbourne. And um, more of that on the individual houses. Folks have sort of done rebates for uh, water barrels and um, things like that. At, at Tree People, they've, they've done um, walls because you could fill the whole side wall of your house with water. But again, it doesn't rain often enough in some places for that to actually be an economic model. It'll keep your yard greener during the summer than it would be otherwise. But in, even in Australia, it rains more often in more places. And in New Zealand, it certainly rains more often. Um, so it's a little more usable. But it's still a good idea, and people are doing it. Just didn't, you don't get the biggest bang for the buck, which is why we didn't go out. But um, I, I think it's a good idea, because I also feel it gives people some control over their own destiny. If they want to have a yard and a lawn longer than other people, they're capturing their own water off the roof and investing in it. So if you can afford it, great. Yeah, I guess you could take care of it, so you could, sure. sure. Hello. Hi. Yeah. I'm, oh, sorry. Thank I'm, you. I'm over here. Hi there. Thank Hi. you for your talk tonight. Um, I like almonds. Yeah. <laughs> I do, too. I Portable really, protein. I love wild salmon and all the things that go along with mm -hmm. a wild salmon fishery. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a lot about how much water it takes to grow an almond, but I know that there's a lot of it's a gallon almond. and almond. Five there's a lot of almond walnut. trees out there in the Central Valley. Yes, right. Can you talk a little bit about like should there be a limit to the number of almond trees that because it's my understanding that a lot of almonds are exported. Yes, all they around are. the world. Yeah. And I live in Moran. I live just a little west of here, and I I have friends that like to salmon fish and we kind of keep an eye on how many salmon are available. So just could you talk about that a little bit? Well, it's an interesting it's an interesting question. I mean, the thing about almonds, a gallon of almonds seemed like a lot, but if you look at, like, burgers are 600. I mean, really, if you wanted to deal with food and what people do, you would deal with meat first in terms of it. So I don't eat burgers. there you go. See? <laughs> you can take an extra minute on your shower tonight for that. <laughs> the, um, that was the confessor part, so... You can't believe the things people wanted me to tell their teenagers. It was unbelievable during the drought, <laughs> who they wanted me to talk to. But, um, but it really depends on the situation and where you are, right? You know, walnuts are five, right? Avocados can be 64 or 94. Don't take my avocados away from me. That's my, sorry. That's the thing for me. But the thing about almonds is it's portable protein that doesn't need to be refrigerated. You know, people tell the story about those folks in Fukushima afterwards where they couldn't eat any of the meat. And almonds are pretty good compared to some of the alternatives. But where they are, this gets to my point, is important. What, what I'll say responsible farmers have done because the prices are so good and they're trying to figure it out. So I, I mean, I think about Paul Wenger, who was the head of the Farm Bureau, and Paul and I are friends. We don't agree on everything, but we respect and like each other. He has sort of a classic family farm. They planted some almonds, but they didn't plant all almonds. They planted some almonds because they got a good price for them. On the, on the, it's a global commodity. And then they had row crops too. So when the when the water's cut back, you let the ro row crops fallow and you, or you buy water from somebody else. But you're, you're not creating this political imperative to get water to people so the trees won't die. Now the problem is one of excess. And part of that I think came more from the 
ground, lack of groundwater management than anything else. I think a big reason why the groundwater management bill passed was not just our brilliant acumen at messaging or the farmers worried about whether their grandkids could farm. It was that they were seeing hedge funds and others from, who are not from around here, wherever here is, planting massive almond trees over overdrafted groundwater basins because why not liquidate a free asset? I can't believe it took so long for people to realize that. You know, and then you saw people feeling like their whole community, that resource of their groundwater basin, that they had kind of kept each other a little bit in check or they were all kind of overdrafting it to grow more trees or grow more things. All of a sudden, other people were coming in and they couldn't stop them. That's another reason why folks needed the seat at the table and some forcing mechanism. So the issue is almonds are fine in some places. In fact, some groundwater basins have used trees to get people to use less water. How? Because if you go to the Mojave Basin, for example, they were growing alfalfa by mining fossilized groundwater. It, in the Mojave area, it, it's incredible. You go out there and it is the home, or was the home, of water skiing practice in the winter. Because some neurologist who really liked water skiing or neurosurgeon really liked water skiing. He goes out, it's not regulated, right? He builds these housing developments, he builds these giant rectangular pools that he's filling with ancient groundwater because nobody's regulating it. And you have all these communities built around these big rectangular lakes that have like water ski jumps in the middle of them. I mean, it's insane. And it dewatered all of the streams that were remaining. So you also have houses fill up to the rafters in sand because nothing could grow and all the sand. I mean, it's an incredible cautionary tale. But when they finally had it adjudicated after a 20 year legal proceeding and the new manager came in and told them they had to cut back, they were like, who are you and why should we do it? And so they brought in a lot of data to show the farmers real data as opposed to preaching at them, smart thing to do. And what they did is they took these alfalfa farmers and they showed them if they planted pistachios, but not their whole land, took out the alfalfa, planted pistachios using less water in total, they could retain their economic livelihood because the pistachios ended up, you know, bringing them in enough. So it's a smart, clever plant. So sometimes a tree can actually help you save water as long as people kind of hold back. But I, I'm always leery of um, picking on almonds, but at the expense of a fish, that's a whole other story. But I think it's largely a... Um, more of a groundwater story than a surface water story, although it's still a surface water story. I mean, in sometimes you'll talk to folks and they feel like they are hapless um, victims of the global commodity market. And being a farmer is, is definitely a, a business and you take risks. It's also a crazy labor of love and a crazy hard job. So folks are, so I, I actually thought during the, the drought, and I'm surprised this didn't happen, I thought folks were gonna come and file waste and unreasonable use petitions with us, asking us to use Article 10, Section 2 of the Constitution where we can say something's waste and unreasonable use no matter how senior you are, or for groundwater we had used it. I mean, I could give you chapter and verse where we threaten to use, usually threatening to use it gets an action so that you don't have as many reported cases. But I thought for sure people were gonna file waste and unreasonable use cases over that massive planting of almond trees over overdrafted groundwater basins in the middle of the worst drought in modern history, and nobody did. Because I could have found that waste and unreasonable use in certain specific locations. So. Um, oh. I wanted to ask about um, the green water cycle. Most of the rain that falls, falls on land. And obviously, if we can get it to soak into the land, oh. then we're adding to the groundwater. Um, when I see those 500 million acres of fallow land, I want to cry because the carbon is evaporating from all of them. And without carbon, the water does not absorb. If we re increase the carbon in the soil by 1%, mm -hmm an acre of land will hold 27,000 gallons more water. So um, there's a agricultural practice that, that applies to even us and our homes that could make a huge difference in what we're putting into the water. But I'm wondering if anybody in Sacramento is talking about the green water cycle and about how we help 
use that system rather than this whole manipulation, sort of artificial manipulation of moving water around to actually restore our water tables? Well, it's, I think it, the, the challenge is so great that people are focusing on where you get the biggest bang for the buck. And so doing spreading grounds that get the water in even faster than, because if you, if you use it in farming, you get evapotranspiration too. But the whole issue of carbon um, in the soil and what it holds and that, there's a whole Healthy Soils Initiative that's trying to get to that. And there's a lot of folks talking about carbon sequestration and all the things that agriculture and soils can do to help with that. When it comes to getting more water into the soil, it's, it's hard because usually the argument is used for flood irrigation, which is the most inefficient way to do it. It may have some ancillary benefits, but compared to the need to try and get water in faster, what I think will happen, because the geology is different everywhere, this is my prediction in some places, some places are using trading regimes and the others, I think there are gonna be some of these groundwater management agencies where they figure out who in the basin has the best soil for percolation. Like say they have sandy soils or, you know, in LA in the San Gabriel Valley and the San Fernando Valley, they can percolate all of it really fast because gravel. Same reason it's a Superfund site because the solvents made a beeline. Two other places it can take years to get down to the groundwater table. So the trick is finding what's the area in a region that's the best for it. And generally, I think the thing is gonna be they all decide to pay Farmer Joe to farm water molecules. And you have a lot of experiments going on, Don Cameron and Terra Nova and other farms, where what they're doing is they're trying to show that they can actually let water stand on vines or on almond trees, and it won't rot the tree or the almond. So they can actually, in the wet times, when there's enough water, they can get it down to the water table so they have it for the dry times. So you, you, we're going to start having different sort of discussions about water rights and about everything else, which people are going to start fighting over wet winter water for recharge, it's already started, um, as opposed to just fighting over the, the um, summer water. So letting it stand and letting it go in in the wetter times can make sense, but there's gonna be some place in an area that's gonna be your best bang for the buck for recharge. And I think people will focus on that first. If we get to the point where we really are talking about a more virtuous carbon cycle and sequestration, I think that I'd be really happy because we'd have a much more sophisticated view. I mean, adding compost does that. Compost is a big deal with that. Um, even adding um, biosolids, in my day we called it sludge, which, you know, was before your time. I liked sludge because it was descriptive, but um, <laughs> biosolids seemed a little too labelish to me. But um, a lot of the biosolids we had in LA, I didn't let it go to food crops, even though we could have legally, but it was used for soil amendments and sandy soil would hold more water and um, actually did some pretty amazing things as long as you did a good enough pretreatment program that didn't have bad stuff in it. So the kind of sophistication of thinking that you're talking about, I hope we get to, and there are people, particularly in the, the Department of Food and Ag, and I think increasingly in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, I wouldn't be surprised, and the composting people at Cal Recycle, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the course of this administration you see a leap forward in that arena. For now, people are just trying to figure out how you get the water molecules in the ground fastest. All right, I think um, we're going to call it an evening. Uh, please join me in thanking Thank Felicia you. Marcus, our wonderful speaker. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, April 28th, our open house discovery day. Fun for the whole family, one to four. If you're going to uh, be around, join us and have a safe uh, trip home.